Welcome back, everybody. I'm Mark Fernandez. You're listening to the Club Metaverse podcast, and I'm joined today by the very special guest, Brian Trunzo, the Metaverse lead of Polygon Studios. Brian, I'm looking forward to this conversation today. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, and I'm looking forward to it as well. All right, cool, man. So, so Brian, tell me a little bit about yourself. How, how'd you get involved in the space, and how'd you get involved being uh, the Metaverse lead at Polygon, which is in my personal crew, a very well-respected blockchain, and and how did you sort of carve this niche for yourself? Yeah, it sounds like you roll with a good crew, I would say. <laughs> um, not yeah. early. I'm not super early on Polygon. I must admit that. Like, I bought Bitcoin at nine bucks and Ethereum at twelve. Polygon, unfortunately, I I, I wasn't early on. All good, all good. We won't hold you to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, everyone's origin story in the space is so interesting. I feel like archetypes have emerged for an origin story, but you know, when you get in the weeds, everyone has a different story. Mm. Um, and, and for me, you know, I uh, I come from the world of fashion. Um, oh, actually, yeah, before fashion, I, I was a, a financial services attorney. That's a whole separate show. Uh, oh, we wow. won't talk about that here. Um, but I was a fashion entrepreneur. I owned and operated stores and brands, um, and I had sold my businesses uh, in 2016 and found myself doing trend forecasting. Uh, trend forecasting is really uh, interesting, esoteric uh, sort of profession. I did it. Uh, where, oh, you were involved. Okay. Cool. I was. I was. I must admit. Uh, a company called Sputnik back in oh, the day. Awesome. I was at WGSN. Um, yeah, yeah. And my job was basically to stand in front of the C-suite and, you know, explain to these designers and uh, merchandisers uh, what the kids were getting into and, and, you know, sort of inform them as to what they should be designing because um, that was how, you know, my business made money and in turn how they made money. Sure. And um, I, I was searching for meaning in my life having exited these businesses and I found myself getting crypto pilled pretty hard um, mm. in early 20, 2017 after having heard about Ethereum, subsequently struggling my way as a non-technical person to get through the white paper, um, basically going down the rabbit hole as we all do um, and becoming a part of the community to some extent. I started cramming information into my presentations about digital scarcity and the emerging ERC-721 contract and this concept of, N yeah, this concept of NFTs before we called them NFTs. I started cramming that into my presentations and try to evangelize this idea of digital scarcity to my clients. And um, long story short, or maybe long story kind of not that long, um, you know, was was laughed out of the room five years ago, and you know, reinvited back into the room five years later. And across those five years, I continued to work in fashion, but built a metaverse and Web three consultancy. Had some really great clients. Um, was laboring for some DAOs, uh, or as I like to say, I was interning uh, over at FWB, Friends with Benefits. Right. Um, and I was waxing poetically about Polygon to someone and my now colleague, Ishan, shout out to Ishan, uh, reached out and said, hey, you know a lot about Polygon and you have the subject matter expertise in, in the metaverse and, uh, you know, we're actually hiring a metaverse lead. We should talk. And uh, that's how that's how it happened. Yeah. First of all, that's fascinating. As being a former New Yorker myself, I, I was also involved in the fashion uh, business and the trend forecasting business. Um, I, I used to be partners with a man named Mark Echo, uh, the great uh, Mark Echo. I don't know if you know who, who, who of that course, is. Of course, of course. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we ended up focusing mostly on, on Complex uh, together. I worked, uh, you know, for Complex uh, running their video uh, program. But I was definitely around Mark when he, you know, was working in the fashion business and also had a foot in media and also... Um, had a foot, you know, with with trend forecasting and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean that's a that's a very interesting backstory. And your your whole concept of the metaverse, because like I definitely want to dig into that. Obviously, I have my own ideas about the way it should be, and I think that my ideas aren't necessarily a hundred percent reflected in the big uh, metaverse projects that are out there. Um, and when when I think about a metaverse. Obviously, for me, I immediately go to its origin, right? And I go to the idea of Snow Crash and Neil Stevenson and the kind of the birth of the concept or, or the word metaverse and where it comes from. And, and the simple notion that the metaverse is essentially a series of servers that are interconnected with other servers 
exchanging experiences and information, right? And the metaverse implies that it's got some 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 digitally created physicality to it um, that's a substitute for the quote unquote sort of universe. Um, and one issue that I see that I'm struggling even in my own project um, is that there is no common protocol for exchanging information between all of these projects. You see a great project like, you know, one that I play a little bit personally and I want to not like it, but I end up liking it every time I play it, which is Sandbox. I'm sure you're familiar with Sandbox. Um, another one that I've been around from the very beginning when I fought, bought my first mana tokens with Decentraland, which I know that you folks are doing a little bit of work with. Um, now I'm making my uh, project and the only way that I'm able to connect with these other projects is by supporting NFT PFPs that I can read your wallet and then render them inside my game. But I have to build all of the three mm -hmm. assets for that to happen. What, what do you think the solution is to create some kind of common language protocol so that my metaverse can interact with Decentraland and with Sandbox and with other side, et cetera? Yeah, for sure. You hit on a lot of things there. And, and I'm going to start with the first part of um, that sort of like line of inquiry you went down. Uh, you, you were asking about my definition of the metaverse um, and how I view the space more macro. And then we can get into mm -hmm. the interchange part, what you're talking about here, this interoperability yeah. part, which is a key component. Right. And, and you hit on that as well. Um, you know, I, I myself am a Stevenson's fan, a Stevenson fan as well. Hot take, I think Fall or Dodge in Hell is actually a better book than Snow Crash written in 2019. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, right. we'll have the vitriol come at me uh, from your fans after this. Cryptonomicon um, is the best one, in my opinion. But I think it's Cryptonomicon, Fall, and then Snow Crash. But, you know, we'll, we'll, do, this, <laughs> we'll do another show for that. Um, but, you know, I... I consider myself to be somewhat of a disciple of um, Matthew Ball, um, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the framework that he laid out for uh, the metaverse that he, you know, tokenized as an NFT and that uh, Polygon Studios actually purchased. Um, uh, one of one of our uh, someone from the founding office purchased that NFT. Uh, but that being said, you know, he laid out eight points. Um, I can't rattle them off for memory, but uh, some of them are, you know. Hardware, compute, networking, uh, so user behavior is actually one of the pieces of freight. Without the user behavior, you'll never have uh, an open metaverse. Uh, and interchange uh, is, is a big part of it, right? And that's, that's what you're hitting on here. Um, not just the atomic assets sort of from the crypto side, from the NFT side, um, but from the physics side, the rendering within these virtual worlds, right? Like how, how to your point, how can you have a persistent synchronous multiplayer internet for a lack of a better way of putting it right this, mm. this immersive successor state to the mobile internet how do you have that if you cannot create a seamless transition between these virtual worlds um and, and the answer to that question is that you can't have it uh, unless uh, you develop a seamless transition between these virtual worlds now i myself am a non-technical person who has a decent technical acumen and aptitude for technical subject matter uh, so i don't have that answer um, you know, there, there are some amazing people working on this problem. Um, Jim, uh, sorry, Jin from Webiverse um, being sort of one of the leaders in the space. The folks over at Metamundo, uh, their Meta Portal project uh, tackling this head on uh, and a few others. Um, but you're, you're, you're dead right. Without interchange, without interoperability standards, we won't have uh, this concept of a metaverse. It's, it's almost like the transcontinental railroad in the 17th and 18th century, really mm -hmm. 18th and 19th century rather. Uh, you know, when, when the train tracks didn't have universal gauges, you couldn't you couldn't send a train from you know New York to uh, uh, San Antonio. It was impossible, right? right. Because the, the train tracks were different. And that's a physical analog for what we have here, right? Like you can't persist uh, in, a, in any sort of synchronous state uh, within and in between and, and among these virtual worlds if we don't have interchange. And what one thing like, for example, um, and I had Yatsu on the show and, you know, uh, the CEO of Animoca Brands, and he's a, just one of the most brilliant folks I've ever talked to. And we were chatting about this concept because Sandbox, um, I'd love nothing more than to be able to create that interchange that you're talking about between my project and Sandbox. And when, when I'm building a website, right, and I want to hyperlink to another website, there's a, a very clear cut 
protocol for me to call upon that other server and open it up in, in a window, open it up in a new browser, in a new tab or whatever. It's, it's very clear. If I want to talk to my uh, to Sandbox from my game, I can't because my game is built in Unreal. And even though Unreal has a ton of hooks to other Unreal type projects, their game is built on Unity. So, you know, that layer, that sort of rendering layer is something that's, um, you know, very difficult to overcome. Now, you have a project like Decentraland, and I and I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe Decentraland is built on web um, XR or some kind of web um, rendering uh, technology. I believe it's web XR. I'm not 100% sure. But that one would be a little bit easier, right, because that one is a more open type of system. But do you think that there needs to be a kind of a, like a consensus rendering layer before we even have any hope of this kind of happening? I don't know if it's a necessary condition. I don't know that we need to. And again, this is my blind spot of not being a technical person, right? So I, so I don't have that answer of if it's necessary. I will say if there was a way for folks to come together and to agree upon that standard, um, that it would facilitate this and, and bring it about uh, much quicker. Um, you know, I'm going to backtrack for a second, as I did on the sure. last question. Um, you know, you, you mentioned not being able to, you know, speak cross protocol, like like between these virtual worlds, which is true. You know, we can't. But this is this is or we can't just yet. The, to me, this is no different than, you know, what we had seen in, in Web one intranet days. Right. You know, you couldn't you couldn't have a conversation between AOL and Prodigy or CompuServe, right? And, mm -hmm. and this feels pretty much like that for anyone who had lived through Web1. Um, and if there's, you know, something that we learned from Web1 and its transition to Web2 is that, um, you know, technology as it reaches escape velocity um, and as we cross the chasm into the mainstream and as people are incentivized to find these solutions, we will. Um, I, I'm definitely a proponent and I'm optimistic proponent of that and I'm optimistic of that. So just wanted to call that out. Yeah, and for your uh, projects, the projects that Polygon uh, Studios is specifically focusing on, is there a kind of uh, a sort of, maybe not a mandate, but a, a kind of investment philosophy that these projects need to be interoperable with each other? Or is that something that you guys, it's a nice to have, but not a need to have? By no means is any of that need to have, um, you know, Polygon and, and all, you know, blockchains built on the EVM uh, being open and permissionless. You know, we, we don't think it's our place to sort of steer people towards um, a certain kind of behavior. Of course, we can advise, you know, if you if you want interoperability with such and such a platform, you might want to consider doing something X way. Um, but it, it's, it's not a necessary condition and it's not something that we thrust upon folks by any means. Mm. And is there a pretty thriving kind of NFT category specifically under the Polygon uh, sort of blockchain? Yeah, I mean, it's um, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for many of us, right? This idea that the next hundred million or billion wallets that enter the space, uh, this idea of where are they going to come from, right? Mm. Uh, and I, I think it's Polygon Studios stance, uh, and it's certainly my stance, that it will come from culture. Uh, it will come from gaming, media, entertainment, celebrity, sport. Uh, it, it will come from where attention is currently, right, on, on these big cultural pieces of IP uh, and entertainment. Um, so with that, you know, we're seeing an enormous amount of blockchain-based games, uh, you know, and, and NFT marketplaces, uh, metaverse projects, you know, all of the metaversal virtual worlds we've discussed thus far, um, Decentraland, Sandbox, I think we mentioned a couple of them, are built on Polygon Rails, you know, NFT transactions take place on Polygon. Um, so uh, along with those Somnium, CryptoVoxels, Mona on Cyber, Spatial, mm. uh, Space, and the list goes on, you know, we have, we have a, a great amount of metaverse, open metaverse partners and blockchain based games. Um, and, you know, to your question about where the NFTs are or where they will be, right. Um, I, I take the stance that, you know, 99.9 to infinity, right. Percent of NFTs that will be in existence 10 years from now have not been put into existence yet. Meaning mm. we haven't reached escape velocity or hit that hockey stick in terms of creating digitally scarce objects that are intended to live either within uh, the metaverse writ large or uh, on top of Web3 programs. Um, and, and the reason that I say that is because we're still discovering the utility for these items, right? It's still 
a speculator's market is still an investor's market. Sure. Most, most people who think of NFTs see them as some sort of asset class to invest in, um, whether it's a collectible or a piece of fine art. And I think, you know, when you analyze the chains and, and you see the average cost of a NFT transaction on Ethereum mainnet versus the L2s, uh, particularly Polygon in this instance, you know, the price of those Ethereum mainnet transactions are thousands of US dollars, right? Whereas right. Um, in game assets, in metaverse assets, will necessarily be a fraction of that, right? I don't have the number committed to memory, but um, let's say the average Ethereum uh, mainnet uh, transaction is a four digit US dollar uh, uh, transaction. Um, Polygon is, is some sort of three digit transaction, if that makes sense. And, you know, what I came up in the video game industry, I worked at Rockstar Games when I was a kid, you know, went through the Grand Theft Auto stuff, went through the rioters in front of our office and and, and all of that stuff. But our, our philosophy back then when we were making games was that you had to hit a million units to be successful. Um, and I believe that that's actually changed quite a bit now, that now you just have to sell uh, like to a thousand users and make a million dollars off the thousand users, right? Like that, that kind of um, KPI for success has completely inverted itself. When you look at a metaverse project um, that you guys are interested in, what kind of KPIs are you looking at to, to gauge your sort of level of interest in it? Yeah, so I mean, we're here as an onboarding engine for um, interesting projects that are looking to build on Polygon, right? Um, so that's to say we will provide a level of service to most anyone that comes to us with a real project um, that's not looking to um, be a scam or a get rich quick. Uh, <laughs> or, so th that being said, you know, we, we do our best to vet these projects and, and we do our best to make sure that we're only promoting those that are actually bringing value to the chains. In some instances, it's more difficult than others. Um, that being said, you know, we, we look for teams that are strong, people with a long term vision for the mm -hmm. space, people who are committed to building. Uh, as opposed to those that are just looking to bootstrap a community really quick, uh, only to just rug them and take away with a seven figure sum um, based off of some PFPs, you know, something like that. So, yeah. uh, you know, we do our best to vet the space and, and look for those who have a, a long term vision. Yeah, because, yeah, the 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 whole kind of discord boom that happened maybe, I don't know, five, six months ago, where like, I don't know where these projects had 50,000 people yeah. in there. And like they're talking and it legit seems real, but then like you realize very soon that there's a pattern to what they're saying and they're not actually all that real. My, my favorite, uh, my favorite is sort of the um, the white list wars or the allow list, list wars uh, <laughs> right. where, where, you know, it's at, at those points, you can't tell who's a bot and who's a human because some of the humans right. are saying things like, have a great day. Like, <laughs> right. you know, I really love this team and this project. It's my favorite. And they're just trying to, you know, drum up activity so that they get put on the allow list. And uh, they're no different than a bot at that point. <laughs> so, right. um, it's It's funny. Do you yourself game a little bit? Do you have a little bit of a love I, for the gaming? I am a gamer. Um, so behind my shoulder here, this shoulder, you can see my Moogle back there. Um, gotcha. I actually have I have a tattoo of a Moogle. So you could guess that Square Enix is my, my favorite uh, game developer and, and Final Fantasy is my, my favorite um, game series. Uh, mm -hmm. The way that I put it to my colleagues, some, some of my gaming colleagues who are a little bit more hardcore gaming, they come from the esports world or they worked at EA or, or they worked at Riot. I think a casual gamer would call me hardcore, but a hardcore gamer certainly would call me casual, right? So gotcha. I, I, I fall in the middle somewhere. And, and you mentioned something very interesting because it's definitely a hallmark that I also associate with the metaverse uh, and metaverses is this idea of virtual worlds. Um, where do you see AR and VR playing into this whole metaverse thing? Do you think that that as a medium will continue to evolve and become that? Or do you think it's a transient medium or we're going to jump straight into Neuralink? <laughs> Will we jump straight into Neuralink? <laughs> I don't think I'd take, I don't think I, I would take a stance that we would jump straight into Neuralink. Um, 
But, you know, I, I do see it as a very important component to the emerging metaverse. And I always use phrases like that, right? Like emerging metaverse, because mm -hmm. I, I do believe that, you know, the analogy of human evolution, the way that we, you know, swam out of the ocean and stood up on two feet and, and sort of became humans, that it, it didn't happen in an instance, right? It, it took millions of years. Hopefully the metaverse doesn't take millions of years to, to emerge. Um, for some, maybe, hopefully, it takes millions of years. But but I do believe that is really the process uh, that we're going through, right? Like, we're not going to snap our fingers and say, oh, the metaverse is here, right? Like, mm -hmm. this full, like the full vision of what it was meant to be is here. Um, I, I think we'll develop and emerge into it. And I think AR and VR will have an important place in that. Um, and, and another point that I like to make on this this line of questioning and thought is, you know, I, I do believe we are pacing towards some sort of snow crash like ready player one like world mm -hmm. um, where we fall short of that or if we actually achieve that and how long it will take. Those are the unknown variables here. But I do think if technology has taught us anything is that we pace sort of ever upwards and ever forwards. Right. So um, I, I do think that uh, that being said. AR and VR and haptics and all sorts of hardware uh, devices um, will make up a very important part of wherever we end up as we emerge. Yeah, and it's interesting. Obviously, you brought up the two, you know, sort of ten poles of the space, and you know, me being a junkie for both of them, they're actually quite different um, uh, books in terms of their overall messaging. I think at the end, the sort of the end morality is is, you know, kind of comes around to be similar, but the metaverse that Neil Stevenson uh, writes about in the snow crash metaverse is one that's built uh, heavily around a highly dystopic uh, society. And so is Ready Player One, but in the, the oasis is seen as the oasis. It's kind of like the, you know, the kind of respite from the horrible world that we live in, where the metaverse in snow crash was heavily controlled by this kind of you know technology monopoly of the enclaves and stuff and i think to me the most important thing about web3 is that web3 really needs to be about demonopolizing um the internet you know and and sort of creating or pushing for that truly sort of self-governing decentralized things where there's quote unquote censorship and and kind of um you know uh content oversight but it's determined by smaller groups of people and those communities it's not determined by some mega enclave that determines it for everybody uh, what what are your sort of takes on that do you see it more on the sort of dystopic side where it's controlled by the few or more on the oasis side where it's like Halliday trying to do the right thing so I, I'm I'm hopeful that it's more of the oasis side um, personally and I see this as a great do-over for the internet and for democracy in many ways, and we can go far downfield with that. <laughs> right. um, but but trying to keep it tight, right? Yeah. Uh, for for me, it's important to always talk about property rights and privacy. Like that, mm -hmm. that is what I truly think this is all about: digital property rights, the ability to actually own assets, for there to be no terms of service whereby you use the asset incorrectly and someone takes it away from you. Uh, the, anal the analogy I always make here is uh, picture me wearing this is a Nike ACG shirt. Picture me wearing this in a Stone Island store and the associate uh, from Nike ACG, uh, sorry, from uh, Stone Island takes it off of me and says, you can't wear that in this store. That's not appropriate. Right. You, you violated the terms of service. Like I don't at that point, I don't physically own this item anymore. Right. And that sure. that that analogy is insane. Right. But it's a it's a easy way to paint the absurdity of a lack of digital scarcity, this licensing model that we've had, this lack of ownership rights within the metaverse. Um, so, so I always like to talk about that. Um, and then on, on the privacy side, you know, th this opt, this, the ability to opt into systems and to not be censored um, and to live uh, a private existence, I think that is a right digitally that one should have. Uh, obviously, there are public policy things that go into that. And I, I think, you know, People can disagree at the margins of, of how far we want to push that concept. Um, but, but I think it always comes down to uh, privacy rights um, and digital ownership. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, on, on the topic of privacy, too, and, and on 
you know, the topic of the way Web2 was built, you know, the concept of users being the product and being monetized, just a race, that is the do-over that we're getting, right? You know, there was a, there was a utopic vision of Web1 that was open source um, that, you know, we didn't have the technology to really bring it forth. And, you know, the advertising vision of Web2 took over whereby, you know, the users of Web2 became the product of Web2, right? Uh, our information was packaged and sold to advertisers. And uh, I, I think one of the most promising things about the metaverse and, and Web3 technology is that we're being given an opportunity to um, reverse that, right? To move away from that model of the internet. So um, I may have strayed a little bit and went off topic a little bit, but no, that's no, no, that's excellent. That's most excellent. interesting about this, yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, I, I always think about it. Um, I I love multiplayer games. Have always loved multiplayer games. There's actually, I believe, the inspiration for Neil Stevenson um, and you know William Gibson, and you can even go back pretty far, was something that I used to play back on my PC on my 286 called a multi-user shared hallucination. And they, you know, we were we called them mushes, right? But that's what it stood for, multi-user shared hallucination, which to me to this day is like one of the most incredible acronyms I've ever heard. Um, so I've always been attracted towards the multiplayer side of things. And even for GTA Vice City, we didn't release it, but we had a fully playable multiplayer version of Vice City that Sam Hauser, the great Sam Hauser, said it wasn't ready. So we didn't release it. But we, you know, I've always been involved in trying to really push for the multiplayer side of things. And once um, probably my favorite game of all time came out, a game called Star Wars Galaxies, which was an MMO that came out back in 2004, I believe. Um, it was really difficult to get a Jedi. You know, it was really, really, really difficult. You know, you had to play for like eight months and you had to do all this crazy stuff. And I had a job. I, I was managing, you know, tens of you know people. I couldn't do it. So I ended up buying a character, right? I ended up buying a Jedi for about like 800 bucks, the greatest purchase I ever made. And to me, you know, you know, to me, that was great. So then World of Warcraft came out and I was like, oh, I'll do the same thing in World of Warcraft. I'll just buy a character there also. But every time I kept buying characters in WoW, I kept getting banned. You know, I kept getting shut up, which I totally get. I mean, it's a complete black market illegal violation of the terms of service. So I totally, totally get it. But to me, something as simple as that is a lot of inspiration for what I'm trying to do, which is like, you know, we build the world, we build the game mechanics and the context, but everything else inside that world that is under the purview of your account, you should be able to do with whatever you want. You know, like that, that is yours. Mm -hmm. You can trade it, you can destroy it, you can delete it, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, and I'm just sort of hopeful that this catches on and the Disney's of the world and the Warner Brothers of the world, you know, because they do their whole NFT thing. But I I wonder if I tried to make a, a a show like this using the latest sort of Batman NFT that I saw DC Studios come out with, if I would be in violation of something versus with the board ape, I know I'm not, you know, like I know that this is like a pure digital asset that I own that represents a much larger, you know, IP, but I have the ownership over this particular representation of it. Um, yeah. do, do you think the big boys are going to sort of play ball with that? I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, content is king and IP is so important. And, um, you know, large IP holders make so much money from licensing the IP. It's, it's hard to imagine um, that they would turn to a CC0 model, the Creative Commons model, for, for any of the IP that they're, they're putting out into the world. That being what, said, I, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Because, what is it? Because I want to poke, you know, because you mentioned at the top that you had a a history of being an attorney or in the legal world. What What is this CC thing that you mentioned? I'm not familiar with that. Creative yeah, so Commons. CC, CC zero. So first off, none of this is legal advice. Um, yeah. <laughs> have, have, have to say that. Um, yeah. Second off, I, I was not a trademark or um, IP attorney. Um, I was a financial services attorney and regulatory attorney of, of all things. Um, but, you know, as far as my expertise uh, in this space, you know, I, I'm a casual observer of the Creative Commons rise. Uh, I was first captivated by it before um, we, 
we had Bored Apes before. Well, actually, it wasn't before we had uh, CryptoPunks, but Solarius 2084 was the first instance where I was captivated by this idea. It was a consensus project, a dead project now, but it was meant to be a transmedia project um, that gave up the IP to the community, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the core part of the idea here is that the issuer of the original creative uh, licensing, uh, the, the original creative works, forfeits all interest um, in the IP. Um, so they, they don't own the IP, it's out there in the world and, and you do with it what you will. And that Solarius, yeah, the Solarius project was meant to be a sci-fi sort of, it was a very Asimov-like um, sci-fi world that was being created uh, and they were going to issue NFTs and then these NFTs were going to live in graphic novels and they were going to make, you know, webisodes and potentially a game. And this was before the playbook for the, the bootstrap a community with PFPs promise a game sort of idea was, was hatched, right? right? Like right. The, this was the precursor to that. Uh, but the CC zero movement is so interesting to me because there's an analog to history here that doesn't get talked about in the CC zero um, world. You know, and that's to say some of the greatest IP in the world is folklore, has been passed down by generations, uh, uh, through generations that's owned by no one. Greek mm -hmm. mytho mythology, Roman mythology, um, the Bible, the Quran, right? Like all, all of these stories are not owned by anyone. They were passed mm -hmm. down, you know, uh, um, the Knights of the Round Table, right? No, no one owns these stories. They were passed down through folklore um, and folks have built upon these stories. Right. Sure. These are CC zero projects sort of at their core, really. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. It, so I, I think there's a really interesting um, point to make here that some of the most powerful stories ever told were kind of like CC zero folklore stories. Oh. Of course, there's a bit of canon there. Right. Like that we have our our Catholic and Jewish canons. Right. But, sure. um, you know, no one's going to tell you you can't like use Jesus or, or Moses or, 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 you know, in, in, in a work of art. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. one, one game that we were working on at rockstar, I've mentioned it on here a few times, never got made, but we were really obsessed with it was that we were trying to do a retelling of Macbeth, you know, because Macbeth is like, you know, one of the most violent plays that Shakespeare wrote. And to your point that the whole kind of open source, IP of William Shakespeare is essentially what drives the curriculum in theater uh, schools all over the world, right? Like, you know, without, without that IP to be able to be freely exchanged, you know, there's an entire generation of students that don't have that kind of foundation, you know? So um, it's really interesting. So, because how does that touch with like the kind of public domain? Because th there is a, a lifespan to public domain, right? Like, after 60 years or something, you could use it or something like that? Or Yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm not an IP attorney, so I'm not um, right. up on those details. So, for instance, I know that like Mickey Mouse, for instance, this year was supposed to be uh, uh, oh, wow. you know, put, put into the public. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, D Disney has the best lawyers in the world, right? And they're of not going to let that happen. Like, they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. not going to let that happen ever. <laughs> so, right, right. right. Um, but there is a weird, there is some sort of weird um, law, whether it's common law or it's codified, I'm not sure, but something about 60 years, yeah. Yeah, and what what projects that are out there right now do you check out and you're like, damn, man, this is like, this is touching. These are these proto, you know, metaverses that, you know, um, that are really kind of showing us, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the blueprint. Yeah, you know, there's the virtual worlds, uh, and then there's the content creators, uh, like these transmedia content creators. And I think there's a intersection of it. All of it's going to influence each other. Um, you know, some of these projects will, you know, last the next decade or two. Some will, uh, you know, evolve into other projects, and founders will move on to other things. So it's a, a very interesting and exciting time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm interested in all the blue chip. Uh, virtual worlds, uh, blue chip, meaning the ones that have been around the longest that have the, the largest user base and, and are sort of like household names to those in Web3. So, you know, Decentraland, Sandbox, Somnium, Voxels, all those guys. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in these emerging gallery-like worlds um, mm. that are smaller in scale, um, that are meant to compete a little bit more with social media and recreation. So the on cybers of the world, I think, you know, Punk6529, um, you know, the, the world that he built Ohm, I thought that was really interesting. Um, mm. you know, uh, spatial, uh, having launched as, as sort of like a, 
uh, a tool for artists and communities to meet during COVID really uh, is, when, and is when they saw an uptick in their user base, which has now become Web3 enabled and, and they're playing into the blockchain yeah, space. Yeah, Spatial's great. Spatial's great. Good stuff. <laughs> Have you ever messed around with spatial in VR? It's so it's so much fun. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. And I know I know I'm not going to leak any alpha here, um, but I know they have some really amazing uh, uh, upgrades and updates coming down the pike uh, over the course of the next few weeks or so. So be That's on the lookout cool. for the guys at Spatial uh, and Mona as well. The Polygon native Mona built in Unity, really great. Um, yeah, I, I love all those guys. You know, I, I think some folks who are playing uh, into the metaverse. Uh, virtual world game who are looking at land scarcity differently. Uh, those are interesting uh, models to, to be on the lookout for. So, you know, Charles uh, uh, Smith over at Nifty Island, uh, you know, he beats his drum of uh, this idea that land scarcity is antithetical to the creator economy within the, the metaverse. Uh, and what he's doing at Nifty Island, you know, he's trying to be the YouTube uh, of the metaverse, right? This idea sure. that e everyone should have a canvas against which they can paint uh, their vision of their virtual world. And, you know, we can monetize other aspects of it. We can use NFTs to monetize and incentivize behavior. Um, but yeah, really, it's so many interesting creators out there. Oh, and I was mentioning the, the transmedia projects, um, you know, the Shibuya.xyz's of the world, the gimmicks, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Sto I haven't kept up on, on Stoner Cats. I don't know what they've been up to. I think maybe Mila Kunis has moved on to uh, the gimmicks entirely. But this idea of, you know, engaging the community, bootstrapping them, taking these disparate parts of content creation, which is, you know, the financing of it, the production of it, and then the distribution of it, bringing it into, into one place, that place usually being Discord, right? Powered by NFTs right. and, and opening up that power to the community for them to tell these transmedia stories is so interesting to me. Yeah, man, Brian, you, 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 but I might try to hire you as my CEO, man. You got, you got, <laughs> you got a good head on your shoulders. Um, here, let me ask you another very important question uh, to, to me, in my project, which is this idea of decentralization. And, you know, um, also this concept of land scarcity um, is also a very interesting one to me because I actually agree with, with, with what you just said. I understand why digital scarcity creates a kind of a natural filter for quality, right? Like, you know, I've, I've been a member of the Soho House, you know, since it opened in New York. And when it opened, you know, I felt special because we all had a place that we could go smoke cigarettes and play foosball with Ethan Hawke and have a good time. And we knew for the most part back in the early days of the Soho House that if you were in there, you were part of this Soho House membership thing, you know? Um, and it created like an elevated level of quality, right? Which I understand scarcity does that. But to your point, when I think of the closest analogs to functioning metaverses out there right now, it's funny. I say this to my team all the time. I think YouTube is probably the, you know, like the best one. Right. And then you have, you know, that then you have Twitter in there also kind of in the mix, but YouTube is more special to me because it is a content platform where people can create their own expressions um, and their own TV shows. And like, I mean, I was watching this Amber Heard, Johnny Depp thing. I can't, like, I can't stop watching this thing. And this thing is averaging over 450,000 live viewers on the Law and Crime Network. If I told you what the hell the Law and Crime Network is, you, you would have no idea what that is. You know, like nobody knows what that is. But they have this mass audience that they've curated over the last, like, you know, few weeks. And it's a testimony to the incredible power of that platform. Um, do you see that um, as a kind of maybe the wrong road for some of these projects to put into their white paper, that there could only be X number of lands and this land is going to be able to get, you know, UGC on it and that's it. We're never going to expand that. It just seems a little bit short-sighted, you know, like there, there's something off about it. I can't quite put my finger on it. Look, I think I think time will tell. You know, I, I think there are I think reasonable minds can differ on um, the importance of land scarcity. And I think it comes down to the business model that um, these decentralized virtual worlds are putting forth um, and, and also the way that they want to incentivize behavior or not. Right. 
Um, and, and I do think novel, interesting game mechanics will arise within these virtual worlds that make it such that certain virtual worlds will need scarcity uh, and others will necessarily need to not have scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think it's early days. And, and what's exciting is I, I don't know that one or the other has it right. And I think uh, maybe a third model, a blended hybrid model may emerge, right? Sure. Um, so it, it's just exciting to be in the room and, and to, to watch these incredible creators create and, and see where we end up. Yeah, because just to make sure that we're saying the same thing, um, when you talk about land in the context of metaverse as it's kind of discussed today with this big other side land sale that just went down minted for 4k and i think the price is already up to like 70k in terms of ethereum conversion um the when we talk land we're talking about ugc right we're talking about the potential for you to create your own thing on that land is that how you see it or do you see it differently no, that that is that is how I see it. Um, one hundred percent. Yeah, nothing really to add. And when when we talk about UGC, do you like the idea that some of these big projects kind of force you into their own proprietary editor, a la Minecraft model, a la Roblox, or do you think that that's potentially also very limiting and pushing away from the kind of decentralized goal that I think we all have for this stuff? Yeah, I think it, it, it is limiting, but I don't think that one way is better uh, over the other, meaning, um, you know, it comes down to what the user wants, right? Um, if, if I want a build, some users don't want to build at all, right? Some right. users just, they want to be users and tourists and, and they want to interact with other people's UGC, right? Just look at like Mario Maker. There are people making the worlds in Mario Maker and then there are people playing it, right? So, sure. um, you know, I think the tools, it comes down to the users. Um, some people will like making in Blender and, and sort of deploying it on Decentraland. Some people will like making in Vox Edit and deploying, uh, you know, on Sandbox. Some people will like making in Unity and, and deploying on Mona. Um, and I think there will be interoperable tools eventually, again, being non-technical, I'm, I'm not the one to answer this question, um, but you know, interoperable tools that will allow one to create a file that can be deployed uh, in various virtual worlds. Uh, may, maybe I'm, I'm naive there and, and maybe that's just wishful thinking, but um, you know, I think it comes down to the user and, and that these virtual worlds will provide the users what they want and users will go towards what they want. Yeah, and what, one other thing, just to kind of go back to the whole decentralized uh, concept, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about about Bitcoin, obviously, is that its creator and probably the most important person, even though I believe it's a team, I did a whole documentary about it. I believe it's kind of like a crew of people, and you know, there was a leader who may or may not have been Craig Wright, but there was definitely four or five people in the mix, right? Um, but the project is still booming and it's still doing great without that kind of core uh, team because it was built on this concept of absolute consensus and the the miners and the nodes all making the constant agreement and stuff like that do you think that there's that these projects are going to be able to survive without the sort of core group still pumping it the way that you know the most successful blockchains are able to survive yeah i, I think the closer a virtual world is to a game, right? Where there's a lot of top-down content being created by the world, right? Um, whether it's a story mode or just, you know, game, like actual mini games that, sure. that the virtual world like co-signs and produces. I, I think the, the more it resembles that, I think the more you need a core team that is either employed by a centralized entity um, or are given some sort of power beyond being a fully decentralized autonomous organization, right? Um, right. But, but the more that the virtual world resembles the real world, right? The, the more that it's driven by UGC, the more that it's a, a place filled with serendipity, right? The way the real world is filled with serendipity. Every day I, I walk out of my apartment, I'm hit in the face with UGC, right? It's just nonstop UGC. Oh man, that's life. Yeah, and and you know wh whether uh, you believe in God or not, maybe you would say there is one centralized party there. But you know, <laughs> I, I, th I, th I think I think we're all in agreement that the social contract that I personally have with the city of New York 
uh, is that no one is in charge here and we're all just trying to you know, get yeah. along and, uh, and, and navigate this UGC as best we can and add value to this city, right? So the more that uh, a virtual world looks like that, like the real world, the more I think it necessarily has to be decentralized. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a game. The game is, is sort of targeted towards a younger demographic, but I think as a student of the medium, you know, I've been around gaming for a long time. You know, I worked at Atari, Rockstar Games. I've owned two video game companies. <laughs> video games are my thing. And um, there's a game for the Oculus Quest. It's also on Steam and, and other platforms as well called Rec Room. Are you familiar with Rec Room? Familiar with Rec Room. Yeah, Rec, Rec Room to me is the gold standard for what I'm trying to do with my project because if you if you browse their UGC library, it is absolutely unbelievable the volume of content that somehow they've been able to inspire their their audience to create. And like I don't know if it's there's a team that supposedly is the you know the the community and they're really making these things, but some kid made a, a playable version of Half Life Alex, which is probably the most advanced VR game ever made inside rec room and they only did like the first few levels or whatever but it's incredible how close it is you know and like you know that game blows my mind i can't sing its praises enough you know and, and like they have a really interesting kind of microtransaction model they don't have any kind of crypto stuff built into it but in terms of an architecture of how this could be when i look at that i'm like okay that's you know that's the one you know and yeah uh, I often like to think of that architecture question of like what would make for the best kind of metaverse. Or actually, it, exactly. comes down to, it comes down to the user, like I said earlier, like the metaverse that I want to spend my time in, right? And um, you know, during COVID, uh, during the height of COVID, in the very beginning of COVID, I found myself playing a lot of Dreams on PlayStation Four uh, uh, from Media Molecule, and hmm. I just think that they did such an incredible job of balancing, um, you know, the, the mini games that they were creating. On, on dreams with promoting um, the UGC that was being created by well, uh, 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 the average user. Yeah. I've never even heard of that. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, dreams was wonderful. I mean, the, the game editor wasn't, uh, again, I, I don't have technical ability, right? So my games were kind of, can, can I curse? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, it's not, it's not a bad one. It's not one of like, <laughs> not, my, my games are kind of shit, right? Like right, my games right. are not, my games were not fun, but I'm not meant to be creating those sorts of games. But, um, so the game editor I found to be a little bit difficult to use, but, um, I was really impressed with uh, the games that Media Molecule put out themselves, but then the creativity of the community. I mean, some people were making a uh, like full blown replicas of, um, uh, Ocarina of Time. Uh, like wow. literally full blown replicas of of, of like a, 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 a what is it Kakuro uh, village or Kakariko village I can't pronounce it but yeah yeah, um, yeah. I, mean, I gotta check that out I've never even heard of that I'm usually pretty up to date with all these things yeah it, it was it was pretty good it's called I, dreams it, just dreams yeah it got me through the first couple months of COVID well that and Final Fantasy VII remake got me through the first right. couple months of COVID <laughs> yeah yeah there there's a it, it, it's funny because when, when COVID first hit, I was actually shooting a documentary in Florida. Uh, ironically enough, I was doing a nature series and I was shooting a documentary here. And then I just decided not to go back to LA until things kind of, you know, this was like the day after Tom Hanks, right? So I was like, uh, I'm going to stick around Florida. Like I have a house in the Keys, so I'm going to chill here. And I got really into um, Call of Duty. And, and like I had never really played Call of Duty um, in the modern warfare world, like, I mean, that, that just like the, the amount of boom that those guys got during that time, obviously, you know, they, they sold the company for an ungodly amount shortly thereafter. Um, but there's a game actually on, on the Oculus quest called contractors, um, that has a really sophisticated open ended UGC engine that just allows you to use Unreal to create maps. So if you know how to use Unreal, you can use Unreal to create the maps, which is the same system that we're using. And they basically created, or, or, or the community created all of the maps in Call of Duty for contractors. So when you play contractors, you're basically playing Call of Duty. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, just, it's just fun that to make a game where you're giving the tools so that, 
your audience can outdo anything that you've imagined possible. You know, like I think that that's the dream we're all after in this space, you know, and, and, you know, I just hope that we can figure out a way to like open up that connectivity, you know, so that if I make a game and I have three things that are really cool and Sandbox has two things that are really cool and Decentraland has one thing that's really cool that we can co combine these things together so that we can interchange our coolness with each other, you know, and, and that to me is the big challenge and I have no answers for it right now, but um, look, Decentraland might be the one that's closest to the answer, which is using this kind of open WebEx technology. Um, fuck, I'm probably getting that wrong. It's I think it's Web v, WebXR, Web O. I think it is WebXR. I, I it is WebXR, it is. right? I, I think so. I don't know, but I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Lately, when I go to Decentraland, I've actually been pretty impressed that the population seems to be increasing. You know, with yeah. with the with Sandbox, I think the most concurrence I've ever seen is probably like 150 in the same, like, you know, sort of server cluster. But recently, you know, there's no way to tell with Decentraland, but um, lately, I've, like, you go to the main room and it's it's filled with people, you know? Like, it's definitely a step up from where it was even like four or five months ago. Yeah, I, I, I noticed personally two booms um, on Decentraland where my logins, I, I would say to myself, wow, there's a lot more people here. Um, one was uh, probably around like October, like Halloween of 21. Um, I, for, I don't know what was going on around that time, but there was a boom around that time. And then I would say maybe like a month or two ago, I noticed another one um, where users just seemingly flocked uh, to the lobby in a way that they hadn't been doing so before, you know, right. POAPs, POAPs would, you know, would, would disappear a little bit more quickly. Um, right. give away, giveaways would just sort of evaporate. Uh, you could, <laughs> you could, you couldn't, you couldn't really keep up with the events page because a lot of people were doing events. So, you know, you notice these like qualitative soft factors. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think, uh, uh, Sandbox coming out of its uh, alpha season two and, and gearing up for alpha season three. I think, you know, every time they release a new alpha, they're being, you know, guarded and protective over, over the release, you know, uh, sure. testing it out. Um, I, I think, you know, we see more and more concurrent users there. So um, yeah, alpha season like, three. Yeah. That'll be interesting. So, so I know we're starting to run uh, short on time and I want to be respectful of your time, you know, especially if I'm trying to recruit you as the new CEO of my thing, <laughs> but uh, the, the, um, um, what does it say about the sort of demographic that you're creating these things for that in Sandbox, to buy one of these alpha season passes, it's like $5,000 USD, you know? And what you get for it is not much except the ability to trade it and hope that, that the value goes up so you can sell it for more than you paid for it. What Do you think that this is a barrier to enter that's gonna be highly limiting to the quote unquote mass market or do you see these metaverses being for the for the rich or not the rich because it's a little different when you're talking about crypto but for the people that are actually holding large amounts of ethereum or whatever yeah. well i i think free markets went out and i think that speaking specifically about sandbox you know that team is brilliant and and they've done incredible things in the space and sebastian has has such a great uh, outlook on the space and has been building for, you know, Sandbox is over 10 years old. I don't, I don't think most people know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an Argentinian it's, based company, I it's, believe. It's wild. Uh, uh, no, Sandbox is uh, French. Um, Sebastian is from France. Uh, uh, Argentinian would be Esteban from Decentraland. Got it, um, got it. But yeah, 10 year, you know, Sandbox has been a 10 year long project and, and they've pivoted multiple times from mobile to pixels to sprites to voxels. Sure. To crypto, so you know, I, I think that you know the market will speak, um, and I do think that the the smart developers, and, and I do think the sandbox is, is a smart team, will will pay heed to what the market is saying. And um, mm -hmm. if people are priced out as we move from alpha to beta to launch, you know, if people are priced out, I think that they'll try to figure that out. Um, you know, a caveat to that is uh, you know staying on the sandbox, they're decentralizing. Um, I, I don't know to what extent decision-making and governing uh, will be sure. decentralized, but they're launching their DAO and, um, you know, they're moving in that direction. So lots of exciting things happening. Yeah, 1000%, man. And look, man, I, I look forward, I'll shoot you an email after we're done here because I want to get your Oculus account because I want to give you a little tour of the one that I'm building. 
Awesome. I think you'll get a kick out of it. I think you'll get a kick out of it. But Brian, okay. man, uh, you know, such an honor to speak with you, man. It was, you know, you have an incredible outlook on this space. And, and you know, typically one thing that I do in this podcast is I, you know, I usually ape into something stupid, um, you know, based on the conversation that you, you know, that I have. When, when I had Scaramucci on, I bought, I bought so much algo rand. And like now, like every time I look at my Twitter, I'm just like, where the heck? Like, you know, he just keeps selling this algo rand. And with, uh, yeah, with BitBoy Crypto, I, I don't even know what I bought with him, but I'm going to buy more Polygon. I'm going to buy more right. Polygon. <laughs> and that, that, isn't, that isn't financial advice. Um, it never is. Never all is. All right. All right. So thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in. This is Brian Trunzo. Where can the people find you, Brian? Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, NTBro uh, on Twitter. So you can follow me there. I'm also on Instagram, um, LinkedIn. Uh, okay, my name you got to tell me Brian what the Trenzo. NTBro thing is. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you right now if you want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so when I was practicing law and I, and I hated my life and I was thinking of how I would transition out of law, uh, I started writing a fashion blog called Nice Try Bro. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> so nice. N, N, T Bro stands for Nice Try Bro. Um, it was a... a it was a fairly caustic, tongue-in-cheek um, uh, sort of uh, review site for men's fashion. I would just, you know, crack jokes about things that I thought were nice tries, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it was uh, actually, it, it, it enabled me the ability to build a personal brand and, and sort of um, leave my position as a lawyer, source capital, raise money, and, and open a store in New York. So That's um, awesome. NT Bro is the handle forever. Man, when, when I was at Complex running uh, the video stuff, we had a, a, a show with these two guys that I absolutely loved. They were so damn funny. It's called the Fashion Bros. It was one of so those our early... So, did, so Lawrence, Lawrence Schlaff. Yeah, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence and I would see. Yeah, yeah. Lawrence is a great. La Lawrence is my dearest. Him? He's my dearest friend. Uh, oh, literally, okay. one of one of my dearest friends. And, and Jimmy, uh, his partner from Fashion Bros. They now have a podcast. Uh, it used to be on Barstool. Uh, it used to be called yeah, Failing yeah, Upwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it used to be called Failing Upwards. Now it's called Throwing Fits. Um, so they're they're still uh, a, a dynamic duo. Those two. Oh my God, Lawrence, man, one of the funniest dudes I've ever met in my life, man. Like. You know, I tried to keep that show on the air as long as I possibly could. Nobody would watch it except for me, except for us in the office. It was our favorite show, but nobody else would watch it. But if you see Lawrence, tell him Mark Fernandez says hello, and I wish him all the best. All right, cool. I will do that. I will do that. All right. Thank you all.